The following video focuses on the scientific concerns both Hugh La Follette and Neil Shanks have about using animal models as analogues of the human condition. Brute science does also examine ethical issues, but they are not dealt with in this video. Ideally, a laboratory-based animal model should be the same as the human disorder in symptoms, postulated etiology, which is the philosophy of causation, especially to do with disease, neurobiological mechanisms, and treatment response. Similarities with animals. We have only to look in the count of evolution or at textbooks in comparative anatomy to see how much we have in common with animals. Hearts, lungs, brains, endocrine glands, nerves, muscles, digestive systems, all built on the same plan. This homology goes back still further as one moves down to the biological elements, like the nucleus, the mitochondria, or the cell membrane, out of which the higher organisms are built. Scaling. Is it possible to predict a human response from a mouse? when the human is about 3,500 times larger or the mouse takes 14 breaths for every human breath or the metabolism of the mouse is seven times faster than the humans. While there are similarities between humans and mice, are the differences so great that any predictions are of little practical value? Most researchers think not. These researchers think that scaling is the answer. That is, researchers assume that once they adjust for purely quantitative differences between species, say differences in body weight, metabolic rate or surface areas, etc., that they may then infer the same effects from the same cause. Since, in the words of Can Smith, members of different species are just the same animals dressed up differently. Scaling is thought to provide a mechanism to disrobe members of different species and to treat them as if they were conspecifics. Conspecifics is a term in biology which refers to organisms which belong to the same species. In summary, most researchers, especially comparative physiologists, assume species differences do not undermine the utility of animal experiments. Unfortunately, comparative physiology traditionally has been, and continues to be, outside the framework of contemporary evolutionary biology, often embracing theories, positions or approaches that contemporary morphologists, evolutionary biologists, and geneticists have abandoned. While comparative physiologists have made an art of avoiding the study of variation, such heritable variation nonetheless is a source for evolutionary changes in physiology, as well as for all types of characters. Because they ignore interpacific and intrapacific differences, comparative physiologists focus on paradigm model species. But those models usually have two significant deficiencies. Firstly, they do not reflect intrapacific variation, and secondly, they are frequently atypical species. Conclusion to Chapter 4 The paradigm governing the practice of contemporary biomedicine is deeply influenced by the work of Claude Bernard. Those working under the paradigm, comparative physiology, prefer controlled laboratory experiments. These mythologies are shaped by a deep commitment to causal determinism. This commitment led Bernard and contemporary biomedical researchers to believe that the only route to biomedical knowledge is by using intact animal systems. They and Bernard assume that members of different mammalian species are really the same animal dressed up differently. That is, species differences are purely quantitative and may be accommodated by using the scaling formulae. Finally, many contemporary biomedical researchers have inherited Bernard's disregard for the subtleties of evolutionary biology. Indeed, most of the flaws in Bernard's views and in the current paradigm are traceable to their rejection of evolutionary theory. 
Moving along the book a little bit, we now get to the chapter called Evolution, the Widening Synthesis, Structural versus Regulatory Genes. Although chimps and humans are virtually identical genetically, they manifestly differ in morphology and behaviour. One way to explain this phenomena is by focusing on the different roles of structural and regulatory genes. Structural genes control the synthesis of the proteins in the body. Regulatory genes, by contrast, control development and physiology by regulating the switching behaviour, on or off, of the structural genes. When we focus simply on the structural genes, the similarities between humans and chimps are striking. However, we can see the likely explanation for manifest differences between humans and chimps if we focus on the differences in regulatory genes. As King and Wilson explain, small differences in the timing of activation or the level of activity of a single gene could in principle influence considerably the systems controlling embryonic development. The organismal differences between chimpanzees and humans would then result chiefly from genetic changes in a few regulatory systems, while amino acid substitutions in general would rarely be a key factor in major adaptive shifts. Kaufman seconds this explanation. The general idea is that a single regulatory mutation can cause very large alterations in patterns of gene expression by disrupting the coordinating behaviour of the genomic regulatory system. Indeed, the evidence suggests that even a few differences in regulatory genes have significant developmental consequences. These findings are crucial to proper understanding of biological phenomena. First, they focus our attention not merely on structural similarities and differences between organisms, but also on the similarities and differences in regulatory mechanisms. Second, they illustrate an important fact about complex evolved animal systems. That is, very small differences between them can be of enormous biological significance. Profound differences between species need not indicate any large quantitative genetic differences between them. Instead, even very small differences allowed to propagate in developmental time can have dramatic morphological and physiological consequences. Organisms and Hierarchical Complexity Humans are not essentially different from rats, nor are we higher life forms. Nevertheless, we are differently complex. Even small evolved differences between members of distinct species may profoundly affect the way they react to the same stimulation. Tabany concludes, the reorganisation of the cellular microtubular system involves the disassembly and reassembly of microtubules. As a result, cell biologists have invested considerable effort into understanding the processes of microtubular assembly, mainly in terms of linear phenomena. The present results show that complex biological phenomena occur as a result of nonlinear mechanisms. These results suggest that the internal chemical dynamics of a cell are non-linear. Historically, however, many mechanistically inclined physiologists have ignored non-linear biochemical phenomena. Evolution shows us that biomedical phenomena are not as simple as Claude Bernard thought. Bernard had a narrow, mechanistic view of biological function. The same kinds of proteins can be isolated from the cells of chimpanzees and human cells. Some of these proteins are identical. Others are different with respect to immunological affinities, electric charges or amino acid sequences. Moreover, although homologous proteins may serve similar functions, they need not. If they do serve similar biological functions, that is a contingent fact about these proteins. Other proteins may serve quite different functions, although they are homologous. For instance, 
horse pros insulin and mouse nerve growth factor are homologous, i.e. that is the same. The probability that their similarities in amino acid sequence could have arisen by chance is about 4 in 10 million. Nonetheless, these proteins serve quite different functions. So, although you have the same protein, the protein has different functions in different animals. Causal Disanalogy, Chapter 7 Strong Models and Theoretical Expectations We can be confident extrapolations from animal test subjects to humans are highly probable only if we are confident that the relevant causal mechanisms in the non-human animal are relevantly similar to those in the human animal. If animal subjects are to be good CAMs, causal analogue models of human biological phenomena, then there must be no causally relevant disanalogies between the model and the thing modelled. Models that satisfy this condition will be called strong models. To the extent that we do not know the extent and significance of disanalogies, we should be less confident that the results found in the animal model are relevant to humans. There are at least two kinds of evolved disanalogies in biological systems. One, intrinsic disanalogy. We may find intrinsic disanalogy at any level in the biological hierarchy. As a result of evolution, causal properties and structures and mechanisms found in the systems of one species may be absent in a member of another species. For example, rats lack gallbladders. 2. Systemic disanalogy. Furthermore, because many biological systems are intact systems, systems composed of mutually interacting subsystems, we may find systemic disanalogy. That is, evolved differences in the relations between an organism's systems. Phylogenetic compromise is an especially likely source of systemic disanalogy. Why are there biological differences between species? Humans and non-humans have been subject over time to divergent evolutionary pressures. Their responses to these pressures differ not merely at the level of gross morphology, but also in terms of their underlying biomedically significant causal mechanisms. Evolutionary theory leads us to expect that we will find causally relevant disanalogies between species, which is why some drugs are safe for animals but toxic for humans, while others are detrimental to animals yet valuable for humans. We know that evolution is conservative in the sense that it uses the same biochemical building blocks across species lines, yet it is radical in that it uses these blocks to serve very different functional ends. The comparative anatomy of endocrine glands share a fairly conservative evolution, so it can be said that generally the same or very similar hormones are produced by corresponding glands of different vertebrates. Despite the gland similarities, hormones do many different things in different vertebrates. The diverse functions of the pituitary hormone prolectin is perhaps one of the most extreme examples. According to Russell and Nicol, ubiquitous species difference evolved to help organisms cope with their specific environmental conditions. Viruses. The Marbury virus is most lethal in guinea pigs and is often deadly in velvet monkeys and humans, but has no obvious effect at all in mice. On the other hand, the Reston Ebola virus is lethal in rhesus monkeys, but has no detrimental effect in humans, although it does multiply in human hosts. Models of ischemic stroke. Some attempts have been made to model atherosclerosis in some animal species and to account for hypertension and increasing age. 
but it is clear that these circumstances do not reproduce the human situation. In fact, most models of ischemic stroke are derived from young animals with no underlying chronic disease or any genetic predisposition to such diseases. Weiber et al. make it clear that the failure of animal models stem from systemic disanalogy. Many variations, both within and between species, have been recognised not only in the vascular anatomy, but also in the histopathologic responses to identical ischemic insults and treatment responses to cerebral ischemia. Intact Systems According to the current paradigm, researchers must conduct tests on whole, intact animals, since whole animals respond differently than isolated parts of animals. In an important sense, the current paradigm is correct. Evolutionary theory does tell us that most biomedically significant properties arise from complex biological systems with mutually interactive subsystems. However, the same theory that undergirds the researchers' claim that they need to study whole intact systems comes back later to haunt them. Since the phenomena of interest are the results of the interactions of biological subsystems, then any causal disanalogies between species may undermine the reliability of intact animals used as CAMs of human biomedical phenomena. Biological reductionism. If human and rats are the same animals dressed up differently, then biological reductionism can disrobe members of these different species. Having suitably disrobed animals, researchers can make legitimate causal inferences from members of one species to members of the other. This response, though, clashes with the latest developments in evolutionary theory. The new biology does not countenance reductionism, neither reductionism of biology to physics and chemistry, nor the reductionism of all biology to molecular biology and biochemistry. Evolved biological systems are complex, hierarchically organised systems, whose causally significant features typically arise from the causal interactions between its subsystems at all levels in its biological hierarchy. Such systems have emergent properties at higher levels in the biological hierarchy that cannot be predicted and explained in terms of even a complete knowledge of the properties of systems at lower levels in the biological hierarchy. These interactive relations cannot be reduced or eliminated. Moreover, since whole organisms, and not just their components, face selection pressures, then there is no way to explain the effects of natural selection, either by looking at the physical and chemical properties of that organism, or by just knowing the organism's genetic composition. The complete phenotype matters too. This is a point recognised even by selfish gene theorists, who represent the reductionist wing of evolutionary thinking. The modeler's functional fallacy. Some researchers claim non-human animals are strong cams of human biomedical phenomena because both species are functionally similar. However, functional similarity does not imply underlying causal similarity. Consider the metabolization of phenol. Phenol is metabolized by a conjugation reaction with either glucuronic acid or sulfate. The purpose of this reaction is to enhance its water solubility and thereby ease excretion. Cats, rats, pigs and humans are functionally similar. They can all metabolize phenol. However, the precise mechanism of phenol metabolism varies widely from species to species. The ratio of conjugation with sulfate to conjugation by glucuronidation in humans is 80 to 12 percent. In rats, it's 45 to 40 percent that's excreted in 24 hours. 
By contrast, pigs cannot conjugate phenyl with sulfate, and cats cannot metabolize phenyl via glucuronidation. Wide species variation in the mechanics of metabolism is also seen in other compounds like amphetamines and the benzodiazepines. In short, functional similarity does not guarantee underlying causal similarity, nor does it make such similarity probable. To assume it does is to commit what we term the modeler's functional fallacy. The modeler's phylogenetic fallacy. Some researchers also claim that since non-human animals and humans are phylogenetically continuous, we can legitimately assume condition 3 is all but nearly satisfied, at least for phylogenetically close animals. Condition 3 is, there must be no causally relevant disanalogies between the model and the thing modelled. However, even when species are phylogenetically close, as are the rat and the mouse, we cannot assume that the two species will react similarly to similar stimuli. Tests for chemically induced cancers in rats and mice yield the same results, non-site specific concordance, for 70% of the substances tested. The figure drops to 51% for site-specific cancers. For example, the carcinogenetic effect of aflactoxin B is more similar in rats and monkeys than in phylogenetically closer rats and mice. And pigs, phylogenetically more distant from humans than rats, are nevertheless more similar from a physiological point of view. Thus to reason that phylogenetic closeness implies underlying causal similarity is to commit what we term the modeler's phylogenetic fallacy. Causal Dysnalogy Chapter 9 Weak Models Evolutionary theory leads us to expect broad functional and biochemical similarities across mammalian species. However, as the arguments in the previous chapter show, evolutionary theory also explains why we cannot assume that species which are broadly similar will have identical causal mechanisms. Nonetheless, many researchers claim animals are useful cams of human biomedical phenomena. They believe the biomedically significant causal mechanisms of animals and humans although different in some respects, are sufficiently similar to justify inferences from the former to the latter. They, toxicologists, report that members of different mammalian species often react very differently when exposed to the same chemical. How could this be given that there are broad similarities across species? The answer, as you might have predicted, springs from the complex, hierarchically structured nature of evolved biological organisms. The Metabolism of Xenobiotics Xenobiotics are pharmacologically or toxicologically active substances that are foreign to the body. The metabolism of xenobiotics can occur in either or both of two phases. In phase 1 metabolism, the xenobiotic is metabolized through oxidation, reduction or hydrolysis. In phase 2 metabolism, the original compound or one of its metabolites, compounds resulting from phase 1 metabolism, is joined, conjugated, with an endogenous molecule. These processes may lead to the excretion of any or all of the following products. A. Unchanged compound. B. Phase 1 metabolites. C. Phase 2 metabolites. Or D. Metabolites arising from a combination of both Phase 1 and Phase 2 metabolism. 
Toxicologists report both qualitative and quantitative differences in species metabolisms. Qualitative differences would include any metabolic reactions that are unique to a species. For instance, we know there are at least seven metabolic reactions unique to primates. Now, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce all the words in this part, so if you could give me a little bit of slack on this, I'd appreciate it. Anyway, like I say, these are the reactions unique to primates. It says one, aromatization of quinic acid. Two, glutamine conjugation of ileolactic and ileolactic acids. Three, o meth of 4-hydroxy-3-5-di-o-do-benzoxylic acid. 4. n glucoronidation of sulfur dimethoxin oxin, sorry, sulfur dimethoxin. Yes, that's quite good, I think. C. Glucoronidation of pyro- Zolons. Six, quaternization by glucoronidation of tertiary amines. And seven, carbonate acyl glucoronidation. I hope that wasn't too bad. Likely, there are still more unique reactions of which we are currently unaware. Other qualitative differences include those cases where members of a given species cannot achieve a particular metabolic reaction widely achieved by members of many other species. For instance, cats are incapable of glucoronidation of many compounds, e.g. phenol, naphthol and other phenolic derivatives. Pigs are incapable of certain conjugations with sulfate, as in the metabolization of phenol, and dogs cannot n acetylate many aromatic amines. We also find quantitative differences in metabolism. Indeed, these are the most common differences. These differences arise when members of each of several species use more than one reaction to metabolize a given substrate, but differ with respect to the relative extents of the competing reactions. For instance, the different ratios of glucoronidation to sulfate conjugation used by humans and rats to metabolize phenol. According to Cordwell, quantitative differences can have profound biological effects. The possible consequences of such variability can be illustrated by a compound which is converted into three metabolites. One, an inactive excretion product, another, a pharmacologically active metabolite, and a third, a reactive electrophile, leading to tissue damage. In such circumstances, which are by no means unusual, variations between, or indeed within species, in the relative proportions of the compound converted to each metabolite will lead to corresponding variation in its pharmacological and toxicological profile in various species. Finally, we also find that there are some differences that have both quantitative and qualitative dimensions. For instance, difference in the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, which is the most important enzyme system in phase 1 metabolism. We now know that there are several forms of cytochrome P450. Sipes and Gandolfi comment. These differ in both the structure of the polypeptide chain and the reactions they catalyse. The cytochrome P450 composition of liver microsomes is altered by the treatment of animals with different chemicals. In addition, the types and amounts of cytochrome P450 vary with species, organ, age, health, 
sex, stress and chemical exposure. As the preceding question indicates, differences in this enzyme system are not merely related to species, and thus of special interest to the current inquiry, but are also related to other intrapacific differences. Consequently, we have abundant evidence that there are clear and significant qualitative and quantitative differences in species metabolisms. However, these differences do not dampen the enthusiasm of researchers for the use of animal models. Many researchers think these species differences can be accommodated. Scaling again. Many toxicologists use scaling formula to adjust for quantitative differences between test species and humans. They assume that once adjusted, the laboratory animal data will be applicable to humans. However, the different ways members of different species react to xenobiotics are not merely relative to size. There is abundant evidence that scaling does not solve the problem of differences in adverse effects between species. There are three problems with relying on scaling formula. First, if scaling formula was sound, we should not expect to find significant intrapacific strain or gender difference in toxicology. Second, since intrapacific variation in adverse effects is amplified by evolutionary processes, then evolved toxicologically relevant interpacific differences will be less likely to be explicable by scaling formula than will be simple strain differences. Thirdly, even if distinct species achieve similar functions at rates related to body size, we still cannot infer that the mechanisms underlying these functions are similar. Predictable behaviour Simple systems behave in ways that can be reliably predicted from knowledge of initial conditions and standard scientific laws. Thus we can describe the dynamical characteristics of these systems using linear equations. Put differently, simple systems exhibit stability with respect to initial conditions. That is, if the initial conditions of two such systems differ only slightly, then their further behaviours will likely be similar. Any differences will, at most, be amplified linearly in time. In contrast, two complex systems may behave in radically different ways, even when their initial conditions are quite similar. In contrast, complex systems have internal connections between their component subsystems. The biochemical synthesis of isoluene an amino acid illustrates these connections among the components of a complex system. The metabolic conversion of the amino acid theroene into isoleucine involves five different reactions. Lyinger et al. comment, if a cell begins to produce more isoleucine than is needed for protein synthesis, the unused isoleucine accumulates. High concentrations of isoleucine inhibit the catalytic activity of the first enzyme in the pathway, immediately slowing the production of the amino acid. Such feedback keeps the production and utilisation of each metabolic intermediate in balance. This interconnectedness between the components of a dynamical system is best modelled by nonlinear equations. Since systems whose dynamical behaviour is described by nonlinear equations are designated nonlinear systems, complex systems are nonlinear systems. Consequently, even small changes at one place in such systems can have significant effects on other parts of the system. Ultimately, it can change the behaviour of the entire system. Decomposability Researchers who predict biological behaviour of humans from findings in laboratory animals apparently treat biological systems as if they were simple systems. Yet the evidence suggests that the differences in adverse effects between species are common and biologically significant. The right explanation is that biological systems are not simple systems at all, but are instead complex systems with mutually interactive subsystems. Nonlinearity and dynamical systems theory. 
we are likely to find that the complex connected metabolism in mammals is best described using nonlinear equations. In such metabolic systems, chemical reactions are causally interdependent, and as Linger et al. point out, biological systems are dynamical systems. The interplay among the chemical components of a living system is dynamic. Changes in one component cause coordinating or compensating changes in another, with the result that the whole ensemble displays a character beyond that of the individual constituents. As Nicholas explains, one interesting feature of nonlinear systems is that the dynamical equations can have multiple solutions. This means that one dynamical system may behave differently as the variables representing the environment with which it interacts, its context, are changed. The mechanism which is at the origin of this diversification is the instability of a reference state and the subsequent bifunction of new branches of states as the parameters built into the system are varied. On this account, two similar, indeed identical, dynamical chemical systems can behave differently if the parameters constraining the dynamics of the system differ. Or, directly related to the current concerns, two similar metabolic systems may behave differently if the parameters fixing the context of chemical reactions differ. In mammals, we observe differing patterns of chemical activity in what are essentially similar biochemical systems. As Caldwell points out, most antibiotics which undergo metabolism do so by more than one pathway, either involving the same functional group or different regions of the molecule. It is generally true that all mammalian species have the potential to carry out all of the metabolic options open to a given molecule. However, interspecies variations commonly exist in the relative extents of the various reactions which a compound may undergo. What is the source of these differences in chemical reactions? What corresponds biologically to changes in the parameters governing metabolic systems? Part of the answer is suggested by Lienge et al. in their discussion of the unity of biochemistry. Although there is a fundamental unity to life, it is important to recognise at the outset that very few generalisations about living organisms are absolutely correct for every organism under every condition. The range of habitats in which organisms live, from hot springs to arctic tundra, from animal intestines to college dormitories, is matched by a correspondingly wide range of specific biochemical adaptations. These adaptations are integrated within the fundamental chemical framework shared by all organisms. The intact organism, as shaped by its evolutionary history, including genetic and environmental factors, and its current environmental conditions, including the actions of parasites and pathogens, is the context within which biochemical reactions occur. This context will thus reflect factors such as species, strain, nutrition, sex, age, time of day and disease states, to name but a few. In short, these will be the parameters governing metabolic interactions. These will be set not only by the organism's chemical inputs and outputs, but also by its internal structure that determines where a given reaction occurs and relative extents of competing reactions. As Cardwell notes, in order to be metabolised in vivo, compounds must pass several membranes to reach the metabolising enzymes, and only in a few cases are only one set of enzymes involved. Although the oxidation of foreign compounds occurs principally, but not exclusively, in the microsomes, as does the hydration of epoxides and glucuronic acid conjugation, many reductases are present in the cytosol, as are the sulfate conjugating enzymes. Additionally, in the whole animal, many organs other than the liver can contribute to metabolism 
sometimes catalyzing reactions that cannot occur in the liver. E.g. dog kidney can conjugate benozoic acid with glycine while the liver cannot and the gut flora can perform several reactions not carried out by the tissues. Conclusion to Causal Disanalogy Chapter 9 Weak Models to the extent that mammalian systems are complex non-linear systems, and the previous arguments suggest they are, then even small internal dynamical differences between such systems undermine the legitimacy of extrapolations from one to the other. Put differently, if these arguments are plausible, then we have good reason to think that the classical model of analogical reasoning is inappropriate in biology. It is not enough for a model systems to be complex, they must be similarly complex, not just quantitatively, but also qualitatively, i.e. they must have the same kind of complexity. Evolutionary theory predicts, and the evidence appears to support, that there are significant causally relevant disanalogies between species, disanalogies explained by differences in the quantity and quality of complexity of the respective systems. Consequently, the hope that animal models will be useful cams of human biomedical phenomena in predictive contexts appears ill-founded. Evidence shows that animal models are not strong cams, and further suggests they are not predictively useful when construed as weak models. Avoiding Causal Disanalogy Chapter 11 Transgenic Animals Most researchers recognise naturally occurring animals are weak models of human biomedical conditions. Thus, they have attempted to design animals that will more closely resemble the human subjects they model. Since we have no good reason to think that the causal disanalogies between natural mice and men will miraculously disappear once we use transgenic mice, then we cannot be confident prior to tests on humans that humans and designer animals will respond similarly to the same drugs. The nature of the developed organism, and not merely its genes, is what is biologically important. Since developmental factors, including which genes are activated and when, are typically different in humans and animal models, they will likely be the source of causal disanalogies. Transgenic mice are not men writ small. Thus, while the disease in mice may be functionally similar to the disease in humans, we cannot conclude that mice and humans will have similar causal and systemic properties so that drug therapies that are efficacious in mice will also be efficacious in humans. To make reliable predictions, we would ideally need a mouse with a human metabolism writ small. Merely inserting single genes into mice will not produce a human metabolism dressed up differently. Genetic Determinism The use of transgenic animals is founded on the doctrine of gene determinism. Yet we know enough about genetics to know that gene determinism is false. It is one thing to insert DNA into an organism, but another matter altogether to expect that the inserted material will be expressed in the same way as it is in the natural organism from which it was originally extracted. All this bodes ill for the use of transgenic animals as CAMs. Transgenic animals, no less than natural animals, are intact biological systems. If the natural animal's intact system differs from human systems, it will still differ after researchers have inserted a fragment of new genetic material. Basic Research, Chapter 12 Until now we have focused our attention on clear instances of applied research where the findings in laboratory animals are thought to be directly relevant to human biomedical phenomena. Now we will discuss animal research when the findings in laboratory animals do not pretend to be directly applicable to humans, but where those findings are thought to expand our knowledge of biological organisms in ways that may be indirectly applicable to humans, usually in unexpected ways. 
In basic animal research, animals do not serve as CAMs. They are not causal test beds to confirm or falsify hypotheses about human biomedical conditions. Animal test subjects are not assumed to be causally similar to humans, and thus experiments on them do not prove or establish anything about human conditions. Instead, experiments on animals prompt the formation of hypotheses about biomedical phenomena in humans. We call such animal models hypothetical analogue models, or HAMs for short, as heuristic devices to generate suggestions about human diseases, animal hams may be fruitful tools of basic research. Hams may be useful devices despite causal disanalogies, including differences in complexity. Evaluating basic research. Every successful research program includes failed experiments and failed lines of inquiry. As pointed out in Chapter 2, that is the nature of science. Therefore, it would be silly to expect every particular line of inquiry to be successful. Rather, we must assess the benefits flowing from the institutional practice of basic research using animals. Since basic research is not aimed at solving any particular practical problems, although it may ultimately result in hypotheses relevant to such problems, it's therefore hard to know even how we could begin to measure the success of the practice. If animal models are hams that can spur research, then clinical investigations, cell cultures, computer simulations or epidemiological studies might be equally effective hams. After all, hams may be useful even if they are not causally disanalogous to the human systems they model and even if they are not targeted at any specific practical problem. The glory of basic research is that it may be useful in unexpected ways. As Kornberg notes, some advances in biomedicine have come from these non-animal mythologies. Investigations that seemed irrelevant to the attainment of any practical objectives have yielded most of the major discoveries in medicine. For example, X-rays were discovered by a physicist observing discharges in vacuum tubes. Penicillin was isolated during enzyme studies of bacterial lysis, and genetic engineering recombinant DNA were developed from the study of reagents used to explore DNA biochemistry. Furthermore, by the early 1960s, epidemiologists discerned a strong correlation between lung cancer and smoking. Nonetheless, efforts to induce lung cancer in non-animal human CAMs failed. Of course, these examples do not establish the success of non-animal research methods. However, they do suggest that these methods may be an important source of biomedical discovery. Conclusion Chapter 16 as a society, we have been so convinced that animal experimentation is astoundingly beneficial to humans that we have not tried to determine those benefits precisely. Of course, cell cultures will not behave exactly like an intact human animal, but often neither do non-human intact animals. And finally, isolated examples explain or illuminate nothing. They become significant only in the context of well-confirmed scientific theories. Theories such as evolutionary biology, which shape the way we conceptualise evidence.